So eventually I had several streams in my garage. Uh -huh. And then I also set some up um, in my basement. So it, I think at any one time I had four or five different oh streams going. It was incredibly labor intensive. My daughters would come over because they were convinced that, you know, <laughs> that mom had a meth lab going. And, um, <laughs> Hi, everyone. Tim Schultz here. Hey, thank you for listening to the Reading the Water podcast. You know, on this episode, we're going to visit with Ann Miller. Ann's an aquatic biologist and the author of The Hatch Guide for Upper Midwest Streams and The Pocket Guide to Upper Midwest Hatches. Ann and I are going to discuss her beginnings in fly fishing and biology, the creative work required to research and write books about flies, and we'll even tell you how a better understanding of flies might help you interpret bug actions and solve problems on the stream. You know, Anna's a fascinating angler. I'm really looking forward to helping you get to know her better. So let's get her on the show. Well, hello, Anne. How are you doing today? Good. How are you, Tim? It's nice I'm to doing... get to chat today. Oh, wonderful. I'm, I'm looking so forward to this. Me too. Um, let's get started. Let's, let's, uh, let's tell everyone a little bit about you. Uh, where'd you grow up? Um, so I'm a longtime uh, Michigan resident. I grew up in a very small town, uh, Saline, um, just south of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and it was truly a tiny town at that time with um, one traffic light. Um, it was a farming town, and uh, but much different now. And, and uh, I uh, went to school at University of Michigan undergrad and uh, met my husband there. And um, now I live in Southwest Michigan um, and right near Lake Michigan. So, and lots of trout streams. So I, it's good, good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, trout stream. So fishing, wh when did you, uh, when and how'd you get started fishing and, and did you start fly fishing right away or, uh, and if not? No, so as a, as a family, um, you know, my, my dad was a teacher. My mom stayed at home with four kids. Um, so we didn't have a lot of money and, um, we would in the summer periodically go to a lake and rent a rowboat and put all the kids and mom and dad in, and uh -huh. we would go out and catch bluegills, uh, and perch and take them home and eat them. And it was great fun, but we had, um, we all had cane poles, uh, with, you know, the old super heavy duty mono twisted up at the end with probably last year's worm on there. Um, and it was great fun. And we, my mom would pack lunch and, um, you know, we, my dad, all he did was untangle lines for the next two or three hours, probably two, you know, uh, it seems like we were out there all day, but I know we weren't. Um, but I think, you know, kids love, it's that whole fish pond, you know, where you, you put something in and some, you get something different out of there. And it was great fun. And, um, <clears throat> and later on, I, I got into more um, fancy fishing with actual uh, spin gear and waders. And um, when I went to grad school, um, <clears throat> I had a, a friend uh, that I met and he was in the same lab. And he was from Colorado and he was really into fly fishing and he tied his own flies, which was such a novelty. That would have been, gosh, I don't know how many years ago, but decades ago. And um, I was just fascinated by it. And um, so the, that summer, we both went up to um, University of Michigan's biology station and um, he took me fly fishing in the, the, first, um, the first time we went out, it was um, at night, we went out hex fishing and he showed me how to roll cast and then left me behind and um, said, no, don't wait out there. Don't do this because you'll, you'll get stuck. And so, you know, I'm one of those people that I don't really follow directions real well. I, I'm very <laughs> experiential. And so it's like, I can go out a little ways. And of course, you know, slipped a little bit and then I was tangled and I had a huge rat's nest in no time, but, and nobody was around. I had no idea where he and uh, the, um, the other guy went, but um, 
so I sat there and then, you know, the, the hatch started and um, pretty soon there were just these slurps all over the place. And um, it's like, oh my gosh, I totally have to come back and do this again because it was just, that it was the coolest thing. I, I still remember it in such detail to this day because I was very influenced by it. But um, so, so your, your first fly fishing experience was hex. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. And without a, without any light. And I probably back then, I probably didn't even have a flashlight, you know, I yeah. was like, maybe they did. I don't know, but certainly, um, I, I, I had to sit there and, and just endure <laughs> until they were done fishing and the hatch was finished and, um, they wandered back and they had a good laugh at my expense and <laughs> I had a good laugh at my expense too. So, um, sure. yeah. But I, I really did, um, you know, become fascinated with it. But, you know, if you are somewhere and there's nobody else influencing you or you don't have your own gear or anything, you know. And so it was a while before I um, purchased my own gear. I actually went to uh, the L.L. Bean Fly Fishing School and I talked my husband into going, oh. who does not fish. <laughs> and we went out and stayed for... Um, Three days and at that time dave whitlock was the head instructor oh yeah. yeah so it was really pretty amazing experience and you know they give you a rod reel line and you meanwhile spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars every day in their store <laughs> buying everything they talked about um and so that kind of got us um down the road a little bit and um so that's kind of how right. i got started did, did, was it a, a, a clean move once you start fly fishing? Was it fly fishing only? You know, um, maybe not immediately, but within a few years it was. Uh -huh. And I met um, Ken and my, my husband, Ken and I did a little bit together. And then we, um, uh, our when our daughter was born, it, then it was a little... <laughs> A little harder to make all of that work and manage it. I remember we went camping with her and thought, oh, yeah, we can take a baby who's under the age of one and also camp and cook and fish. And that was turned out to be um, not really very practical. So I was more interested and I kept at it. And um, there was <clears throat> I in. Dave Whitlock, he, he said, you owe it to yourself and to this sport to join two organizations. One was Trout Unlimited and the other was um, Federation of Fly Fishers. And, and I did. And so then I started getting um, newsletters from each. And, you know, they, it sounded like these groups were doing a lot of fun things. And I really wanted to reach out and become involved. And, and I did that. Um, and somebody that I met um, that very much influenced me and, and helped me along was Dorothy Schramm. Um, and she was mar to, married to Jim Schramm who recently passed away um, and very influential anglers, um, important in uh, many legal battles in Michigan, a lot on, um, um, hydroelectric power and decommissioning dams and, you know, getting bottom flows. And, uh, but, but Dorothy was, is an amazing teacher and probably, probably just about the best caster that I've ever met or witnessed. I mean, the things that she can do with a fly rod are, are really phenomenal. Um, but um, so then, you know, my, my learning just skyrocketed and, you know, when you have a mentor and uh, can be with somebody and they're teaching you all their little tricks and, um, you know, you just, you just soak it up, you know, you're, uh -huh. you're a sponge. So um, they were, they were very influential. And so they were, and so they were part of, uh, they were the really kind of at the helm of the Great Lakes Council of the FFF at that time. Now, of course, FFI and um, <clears throat> that organization has changed a bit, I would say mm -hmm. since, but, um, yeah. So you, you studied biology at the university of Michigan. Yeah. Um, so I, I studied, um, 
biology. I, you know, I started off my, I had an uncle that was a pharmacist and he, you know, he convinced me that that was a great profession. And so I, I went to um, U of M to, to take up pharmacy and, and, you know, it was, it was okay. It was like, it was, but I had some biology classes and it was like, I just fell in love with that. It was just more, it was just fascinating to understand how things work and why things, you know, in nature are the way they are. And so I, I switched um, degrees. At first I tried to think I could be both. And then, you know, I committed to, to being a biologist. Then I um, spent some time up at the University of Michigan Biology Station. I took a class in um, phycology, which is the study of algae. And I really fell in love with that. Of course, you get to be in a stream and, you know, you're collecting sure. things and looking in the microscope. And I had a really great professor, um, uh, Dr. Rex Lau, and um, he was just an amazing teacher. So I went to to study with him when I went to grad school and he was at Bowling Green State University. And then that summer when, um, well, one of the next summers that I was at um, the biology station, we called it bug camp. Uh -huh. I took an entomology class and I totally just flipped for bugs. I just, I found them to be incredibly fascinating. And, and so at that point I was like, I was, I was doing my uh, research at that time for my, um, for my master's degree. And I remember just feeling really conflicted. Like I should have, if I had been here first and taken <laughs> entomology bugs, um, I, I would have totally become an entomologist and scrapped the algae. But um, so I kind of got into, to bugs later. I really, um, as the fly fishing came along, I, I kind of dovetailed fly fishing with the bugs because nobody else, um, well, let me back up a little bit. So my friendship with Dorothy Schramm, um, we ended up teaching a lot of fly fishing to, to women. And we were doing workshops and schools around Michigan. And I always taught the entomology section because you know, I, I was the one who knew about bugs. And, and I, of course, I got super excited every time. And that if your your own enthusiasm helps other people to to also all of a sudden be like, wow, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. And and so I kept studying. I really just dove into everything I could get my hands on about aquatic entomology and fly fishing and imitating bugs and behaviors and um so that's kind of how that happened. And then eventually Dorothy and I, after we would do these workshops, we had a workshop that we offered. Um, the first big one we did was in um, Rockford, Michigan. And we put out some, you know, advertising. And I don't even recall now how we, how we did all of this, but, you know, we had over well over we had like 150 women sign up and we we had room for 50 and wow. <clears throat> so it was a overwhelming success and we did repeat that um i think later in the summer even and so then all these women um said well now what do we do you know what's next <laughs> and uh -huh. so dorothy and i were you know we thought on that for a while we decided we would would start a group um called fly girls and uh, we we didn't we didn't make it an exclusive club by any means. We we certainly have men in the club too, but we we really wanted to gear it to whip for women so that they could yeah. overcome the hurdles. And this was in the '90s when a lot of times you know you a woman might go into a fly shop and no one would wait on her. It's right. Like, you know what are you what are you in here for? <laughs> um, and a lot of us had experienced that, and so. Um, we, we, I don't know, Dorothy and I, we, we continued to do, you know, lots and lots of schools and workshops. And we probably touched, we probably touched thousands of women really over the years. Sure. Um, and Fly Girls has been just a great organization. It, um, 
it's allowed women to learn about fly fishing in a very, you know, nonplussed environment uh, to ask questions, not be, you know, fearful at all, um, to get help with buying gear or and so forth. Um, <clears throat> And then, but the other thing that, you know, and, and, and really we're, we didn't want to have a club that required a lot of administration and work. We just wanted to sure. get together and fish. Right, right. And, and so that worked out well. And we, we, um, as a board, as a, on our board of directors, we, we only meet virtually now for the business part. And then we, we, the rest of the year, we just have events where we get together and fish or tie flies um, and, and so we have eight or 10 events a year that that's what we do. And, um, the result of that is that initially when we first started, um, there were a few of us that were kind of leading the pack, but as a result, you know, all these different friendships formed and then little pods of people could go off and fish on their own and plan their own vacations and, um, fishing events. And, and that was something that I guess we hadn't really force foreseen um and it was really i don't know that's probably makes me as happy as anything does just uh -huh. that that happened and oh so. wow so how how did this this uh convergence happen that you bring fly fishing and your love of bugs together and you put out the first upper midwest hatches book so um <clears throat> Let's see. This would have been so one of one of my friends in Fly Girls um, worked in. I forget now exactly what her title was, but she she moved away and she was living in Colorado and she was in the book industry, and and I don't know somehow in the publication end of it, but she was at a show or a you know, something professional. And she met Frank Amato and um, Frank at that yeah. time had published um, Hatch Guide for Western Streams by Jim Schulmeyer. Mm -hmm. And then recently had come out with Hatch Guide for Eastern Streams by Thomas Ames. And Sue, my friend, went up and said, well, when are you going to publish one for Midwest Streams? And he says, well, I don't know anyone in the Midwest do you? <laughs> and uh -huh. she says, well, actually I do. And so she connected Frank and myself and we, we talked on the phone and, um, <clears throat> you know, I knew a lot about bugs, but I, I was not an expert at that time. And, and so I said, well, let me think about this. He said, would you be interested in, in undertaking something like this? And I said, well, let me, let me think about it. And, um, and so I just, I didn't, I don't know. I thought about it for a couple of weeks, but it was like, yeah, I also had, um, three daughters at home and all of that, what all that entails, they were, you know, in elementary and, um, middle school, but I, I just said, yeah, I'm going to, I'll do it. And I, I, he said, well, how long do you think you will need? And I said, well, I think I could do it in three years. So, <laughs> which was not enough time. <laughs> and also, um, I, it, but that's how we got together. And so <laughs> to that end, um, we, we signed a contract and it pretty much started January 1st, which was not very smart on my part because there's not a lot going on January right. 1st world of bugs. Uh -huh. So I started going out and collecting and uh, identification and photographing. And I had to teach myself all of this. I didn't have, uh, I had a friend that helped me with a couple friends that helped me with photography uh, um, and figuring out, you know, how to photograph insects that are moving, how to slow them down, how to get the lighting right. How, <clears throat> And as I went on, you know, I, I, I learned a lot on my own as well. And, <clears throat> and was, I, was this full time for you at that point? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that first year, I, I was having good success with 
you know, photographing nymphs and larvae, yeah. which, you know, there are some tricks to slow them down and um, get their pictures without, you know, you can put them in the freezer, but if you leave them in too long, you know, then they're going to die. And yeah. um, it, it, there are other little tricks, additives that you can, you know, put in and will slow them down. But again, if you add too much, you kill them. So there's, there was a learning curve there. But as far as adults, I was having a lot of trouble getting insects back to my, so I was taking all, I, I set up a photo studio at my house. Um, and I, and I had decided the way that I wanted to photograph them was I didn't want it all on a blue background or I wanted it. And if you have a totally natural background, um, it's very distracting for identification. So some people had set up, you know, taking pictures against green leaves and things, and you, you can't yeah. always get your lighting right or um, the best way to, if you can get a, a three quarters perspective on an insect, that way you can see the head, wings, tail, body, um, and, and can't always get that. Um, it depends on how well the insect's cooperating. So, but, you know, if, uh, 90 degrees flat, you know, to somewhat turn is best. Anyways, a lot of that, and it, and if you're trying to do it in um, in nature, then obviously the insect can also fly away. Right. <laughs> so I decided I was going to photograph them at home, which meant I had to capture them in the field, bring them home. But then I was also running my kids around after school to dance or to band practice or, you know, any number of things. And then I'd get home and I'd get my insects and they'd be dead. You know, they, maybe I, they'd gotten too hot in the car sure. or they'd been in the car and um, maybe with the heat, part of their body had stuck and then their tails broke or their wings broke. And by June of that first year, I had one photo that I considered, you know, publishable <laughs> as far as oh my this goodness. Is a photo. So I had a, a serious panic attack. And I just, I said, I got to figure out another way to do this. And so I decided it in, when I had been up at um, bug camp, you know, in grad school, we had, um, you know, there were a lot of um, people that set up artificial streams so that you could, you know, do treatments to different streams and then uh, examine whatever. Some of it was in pretty much, they were doing this with diatom study. And I thought, well, maybe I could set up an artificial stream and raise insects and then hatch them out. And then uh, then I'd be right there. I'd have a nice fresh bug and uh, wouldn't have any broken parts or wouldn't die. And, and so I devised um, an artificial stream using um, a pump. And then I kind of set up um, an eaves trough with... Um, material from the river. I brought river water in, I controlled the temperature, oh I added extra oxygen, and then I would inoculate my streams with um, maybe two or three species of insects. So for example, I'd go out and get, you know, maybe 30 nymphs of Hendrickson's. Um, um, and then I might add, you know, some sulfurs in there too, and, and then just study those intently um, and it worked really well. And I, I put wow. like a netting over the top and then I could reach in there. I got males and females and, and oftentimes, um, especially with, with mayflies in, in certain uh, uh, subfamilies, their males and females are different colors. So uh, it worked great. And then all of a sudden I was getting, you know, all these great photos. So Oh, wow. Probably midway through that first year I, after I figured things out, um, it went well. And then I just created this giant spreadsheet of check marks. You know, I got this one. I got this one. It's kind of like if you're a baseball card collector and it's yeah, like, sure. oh, I got the Mickey Mantle, but I, you know, I still do, <laughs> you know, whatever, Ty Cobbs yeah. and woo. so and that went on for the next um, following two summers. Yeah. Where, where was your stream? Where, where did you have the stream set up? So eventually I had several streams in my garage. 
Uh -huh. And then I also set some up um, in my basement. So it, I think at any one time I had four or five different oh streams goodness. going. It was incredibly labor intensive. Oh, I can't imagine. So you had a, a, a lot of friends that that were anglers, but mm -hmm. you have some friends that weren't anglers. And what did they think? Well, my, my, what you were doing? Daughters, <laughs> my daughters would come over because they were convinced that you know, <laughs> mom had a meth lab going. And, um, yeah, right. quite, I came quite a little local celebrity. Um, a number of teachers would stop in and, um, and then yeah. they were pretty excited, you know, they'd be like, Hey, if you have to borrow any equipment, you know? And um, so, yeah, it was, it was quite a hoot. Um, but it, it really was, totally labor intensive and oh my goodness yeah yeah you know i have to tell you so i have the recent book and we need to talk about how that came about but uh for the last two days i have been and i think this is a huge compliment um uh, i have been looking all over my house for that first copy i cannot find it and yes. what that's the one yes and yeah. and and the reason but that's a good thing in this sense uh when I can tell you, go find a book on a shelf, that probably means it's been sitting on that shelf for a long, long time. It doesn't get used much, but your book I used, I, 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 and that's why I can't find it. I don't know where it is. It's, it's either in with all of my fly tying stuff or maybe in my car. I, I don't know where that one is. Yeah. Well, hopefully, yeah. you know, nobody stole it from you. And <laughs> right. Well, now let's see. So when was that one published? So that was published in, I think the, I think it says 2011 or does it 12? Okay. Um, I'll tell you right here. 2011, but yeah. it was published in at the very end of December. So really technically it uh, was 2012. Uh-huh. And it, um, it had two printings It it did very well, but then um, Amato used a printer publisher, a printer in Hong Kong, um, which, you know, they could, it, it basically got mm. printed them for very inexpensively on very high quality paper. And, uh, but there was, you know, the political issues that I can't remember what year it was, um, probably, I don't know, 2015 maybe or 16. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Hong Kong changed a lot. And the the, pub, the printer just packed up all his gear and left. And Amato, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the whole story on that. But they they dropped all of them, most all of their books. Oh. Um, and, and that was it, you know. And... <laughs> I found out the hard way. I went to order more books and they're like, oh yeah, they're, they're gone. And yeah, right now we don't know when, I don't know if we're going to pump, print those again. And oh, then wow. I found out, you know, the other books had also gone out of print. So not very professional in my opinion, but. Right. So I kind of, I was so angry and then I was, you know, just pouty about it. And then, then I decided, well, you can, you know how to do this. You can reprint it yourself. And, and I started to explore those options. And then, um, then COVID hit. <laughs> right. And um, I had, I had also reached out to, well, I think, I don't remember the order. So I might've reached out to, to um, Jay Nichols or, um, I think her might name is it Jane Schnell? Schnell, I forget. She's kind of head of that, but um, mm -hmm. it was COVID. Nobody was in the office, and I kind of fell through the cracks. And then I just started to pursue self-publication, and and then um, later on, Jay tracked me down. I think in September, and I talked to him for a while, and and then I just decided. Okay, I'm, I'll go with Stackpole, and, and I'm glad uh -huh. I did. They, they've got a just a really, really wonderful uh, support staff, really good editors. I, 
I'm amazing editors actually. Um, oh yeah. I mean, there were, so all of the flies, I, I had local people tie who are really exceptional tires, tie most of the flies and submit the recipes. And the editor that I use for the fly tying, she's, she, she was like, do you mean hair's ear plus or hair's ear ice stepping? <laughs> or do you mean, and I was like, oh, I, wow. So I had to go back through a lot of the, the recipes and, and really clean them up. She, she totally, um, you know, put a candle to my feet there. <laughs> it was kind of yeah. like, but for, for it, better. It, I mean, it shows that book is very professional. It, it, it's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, the other yeah. thing, you know, over the years as, as people would say, oh, I really like your book. Um, but the, the first one, and, and they said, I wish you had the page number for the flyer tying recipes. And I thought, you know, that's a great idea. Of course, that means that, you know, once you have the, the copy to edit, I, that, that means I have to go back there and do all of that. Right. And, um, and the same with, with the index, it, and it, you know, I don't know if you've had to write an index, but an index is incredibly painful to write. Mm -hmm. And you, I think people must think that, oh, well, that's probably done, you know, by the editor, but no, it's done by the author and um, it's painful. It, but, you know, if you have a good index and you're the end user, it's terribly important that it's exactly. correct. So in this one, I, the second one, you know, I wrote um, two indexes, one for the the scientific names of the bugs and then one for the fly tying recipes, which uh -huh. so I, I put quite a bit more into that. And of course, I added all of the uh, terrestrial insects, which I had intended to do with my first book, but I ran out of time. Uh -huh. So. So, yeah. uh, let me ask you about the fly tires i you know i recognize many of the names in your your acknowledgement um w was that um difficult to get them to help you with the patterns uh, tie some patterns for you or did most of them uh happy to help oh i had wonderful tires i mean yeah. they were very happy to help and um <clears throat> you know i've learned a lot from them and, uh -huh. and probably vice versa, I hope. Um, but some of them, you know, I, I just spent hours on the phone with, you know, Jerry Regan and I, we, <laughs> we still, it's like, well, I need to ask you a question. And right now I'm writing an article and um, Jerry just had a, a social media post on um, tying Borchers Drake, which the original, Jerry's just a wealth of knowledge. I, I don't know if you know Jerry. Well, really. I, 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 I want to, when you finish, if you don't mind, I'll tell you a quick Jerry Regan story. Okay. Yeah. But um, he just, you know, he grew up with all these famous grailing tires and he knew, he knew their back history, their family history, you know, if they, you know, everything about them, you know, what, what age they were when they died, if they're still living now and, Oh man, he, he's really a tremendous wealth of knowledge and a, a fabulous fly tire, but you know, yeah. it's like, well, you know, you really use condor feathers in there, but um, of course you can't get those in anymore. And then you'll go, ah! you know, it's got a great <laughs> laugh. Yeah. But, well, oh, I, 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 I was, uh, I, I took a trip into the lower peninsula and I was spending time around grayling and um, uh, and I got up one morning and I, I went to a, I forget the name of it, but I went to one of the little cafes in downtown Grayling. And, and this guy comes in, big, tall fella, and, and, and uh, he just holding court in that, you know, telling jokes. And they're referring to him as Jerry. And I thought, you know, I kind of recognized his face from things I had seen before. So uh, I asked when I was paying my bill, I asked it. To, person I checked out I said is that who is that and she said oh that's Jerry Regan and I said oh really I said would he mind if I introduce him? she said oh no he loves people and so I introduced myself to him and I told him that I I had been using his flies and I, I told him my, my favorite fly probably uh are the, the Robert Yellow Drake and the Borchers and and we we're talking outside a cafe and he said what are you doing today and I said I really don't have anything to do in the afternoon I'm just on my own and he said come on over 
and I followed him over to his house. He took me in the basement and he tied up some uh, Robert Shellow Drake's and, and he tied it with one without, without a, um, a vice. And, 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 but, and he just talked and told me all kinds of stories and he tied a couple of other flies and he gave me about five flies that he tied right in front of me. And, and he said, take these, Oh, you'll catch some fish with these. And I said, well, with all due respect, those flies will never catch a fish. <laughs> They're going in a shadow <laughs> box on my wall. Yeah. And, uh, but then he said, he, we went out and he showed me his, his, uh, his boats, his, his Osala river boats. And, in, and I look at them and, and there's rods in them with automatic reels, you know, the, yep. and I said, what? Yep. And he said, well, if you're going to fish while you're polling, you have to have the automatic reel. And, right. and he said, you know, the guides these days, they don't, they don't, you know, nobody can catch a fish if you're guiding. And he said, I used to catch a fish just to show the client that they're doing it wrong. <laughs> and then, <laughs> but then, like you. oh yeah. yeah. And then he said, uh, you want to, you got more time? And I said, yeah. And he, he said, you want to learn about these boats? And now I'm going to I'm, I'm, I'm going to forget the fellow's name, but he took me to uh, this shop with where the guy is uh, always oh, a legend in the boat building in that area. Uh, if you said his name, I would remember it. But uh, and then I spent the rest of the day listening to those guys exchange stories and learning about the boat. So I, I ran into this guy, didn't know me and took me under his wing for a whole day. Yeah. No, I yeah. love Jerry. Yeah. yeah. He's great. He, so he tied a lot for me. Bear Andrews did, um, uh -huh. of course, Dennis Potter and, um, you know, just, and, and then somebody, uh, well, uh, a guy that he had some family in Michigan, but I, I met him at a, at a trade show and taking classes from him, Oscar Filu, um, beautiful beautiful tire and uh -huh. um but he's no longer with us and uh -huh. but uh, you know wonderful friendships um and i think people in the fly fishing and tying world are some of the most generous people with with knowledge with materials just uh -huh. so here you know take this and maybe i hopefully you know people have experienced that but you know it, it's I think that's besides, you know, just imitating bugs and catching a fish. I think the people that are involved in fly fishing are really extra special. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hey, when you were digging in, when, you know, you're, you're becoming the expert on upper Midwest flies, no doubt about it. Um, did you learn anything that, you know, I, I, I kind of think of it as maybe urban legends. And did you learn anything that was conventional wisdom about flies that was not true? We were just wrong about that. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, if you looked at my fly fishing library, you know, I would have all of these bug books in there. And, and so, I mean, you know, I, I started off really more as a, fly angler and then tackled entomology instead of the other way around, which, uh -huh. um, you know, I, I still had, I, you know, I had a couple other entomology classes, but, um, if, if I had been an entomologist first, uh, that would have been, I always wonder like, well, I wonder how that would have went instead. But sometimes when you learn things the hard way, like, uh -huh. you know, like, think of woodworking tools and you kind of figure things out on your own. And then, and then somebody who's been trained, they just come up and show you and you're like, well, duh, I guess that right. makes good sense. So there were insects that I couldn't find. And, and, and when I say that, I mean, so I, I wanted to have all stages of the life cycle illustrated, photographed, discussed everything about them that, with the flies on the opposite page. Yeah. And I could not find a couple of different um, species of things. And one of them was um, gray drake, so Syphilinurus. And the I found that a lot in a lot of cases there were, you know, texts or articles or even books that would write that the habitat that they live in is like, we're not really sure, but we think it's here. And there was a case of, you know, a, a gray drake found in such and such a habitat. 
very deep water in a river. And, you know, I probably could go out there and try to, and I'm not very tall. I be trying to seine these um, areas and um, there, there were no gray drakes. And so I, I just started sampling. I would go to different sections of the river. You think, well, I don't know what, what's in here, but I found um, areas where insect nymph in the nymphal stage where insects would migrate back into. And um, it turns out the gray drake um, was one of them. Um, and then a few others, and I won't get into all the different bugs, but um, once I figured that out, you know, I, I, I did start, I wrote about it. I, I, you know, do write for Michigan trout and, um, have written about that, but they, they actually, you know, they're, the eggs are laid in a, in a gravelly section and then they live for a year, but over the course of that year, they migrate into other areas. So into more shallow waters and back up into little tributaries. And they, especially like, they, I, I found them associated um, with uh, plants along the, the shoreline and, and I found them in there by the hundreds. And of course, at the time, I didn't have a camera with me and I've never been able to find that again, but someday I will. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I found them in places where, you know, they weren't supposed to be. And, and um, so, yeah, that was, that was fun. And, and I found, you know, other things like that. And um, yeah. Isonychia, for example, um, the, the classic, when, when you listen to some of the, the, the fly, the professional fly anglers, and it's like, oh yeah, Isonychia crawls out to, you know, to hatch. And it's like, yeah, but they also can emerge from the water. And, you know, we, I think in Michigan, we all are aware of that, you know, you see them coming along and right. Up right next to you. So there are things that people repeat without the experience or, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm careful to, to never, um, well, I like to go to the river and always learn something. And so and I'm, I'm still learning stuff about insects. It's like, Oh, wow. Look at this, you know, just just because you haven't read about it, um, it, it might mean that maybe, you know, somebody that has seen it just isn't a writer and hasn't put it out there. And mm -hmm. um, so always learning something new. You know, one one of the crazy things that, that uh, I, I get involved with regarding flies would be being on a river, a few people out there, everybody's exciting. It's brown drake time. And the sky starts filling up with brown drakes and everybody's waiting and waiting and waiting. And then they go back. They, they don't make it to the water. Are you any better? And, and then everyone has a theory as to whether or not they're going to hit the water or not. Are, are, are you better at predicting? Can you, if you're out there, could you tell us if they're going to get to the water tonight? <laughs> <laughs> brown, I think brown drakes is one of the, the most difficult, finicky uh -huh. hatch out there. And I have experienced that, of course. Um, am I any better at predicting it? I feel like there's a certain temperature, humidity uh -huh. um, factor that goes into that. Um, do they come back in the morning or early morning, you know, maybe when we're not up? Um, uh -huh. Certainly possible. I will tell you that um, one thing I, I learned with um, my my artificial rivers if if i were to bring into so let's say a, a female lays 1200 eggs um and obviously they're not all going to hatch out some will be eaten as smaller nymphs um, some will just you know perish whatever so but of that clutch of eggs so they're all identical. So ideally they should all hatch at the same time. They probably won't, but they're going to hatch within, you know, a, a, a certain amount of time from one another. And the first, first to hatch out are males. And then males might hatch for a couple days in that cohort before the females start to hatch. And so oftentimes, you know, I'll sit there and I'll look at, um, especially with brown drakes, when you see, I mean, you can, you can tell males and females in flight 
because the males, males fly up and down typically, depending on the species. There's a couple that fly side to side, but males will fly up and then fall back down and then fly up and fly back down. Mm -hmm. So when you see a mayfly swarm and you see, you know, insects flying up and down, up and down, then you know those are probably all males and they come to the river first and they are emitting some pheromones and, you know, hoping that the females show up. If the females don't show up, then the males just, you know, they have to preserve some energy to attempt to mate, you know, later, whether it's early in the morning or they come back the next night. Uh, And then, you know, my experience in raising mayflies, some of those bigger mayflies like brown drakes and hex, they can live, you know, two or three or even four days mm-hmm. um, on the on their energy. If, if Now, if they're flying around and stuff, obviously, probably less. So when I look at a swarm, I'm looking at them. And, and if the lighting is just right and you can see males yeah. only, you know, what you really want to be looking for is then the females coming through. They're going to fly straight through and then the males will attempt to grab her and mate. So that's really what to look for. And Uh uh when you see males and females, then you know you're going to have at least some kind of a spinner fall. Um, The other thing is, you know, for sure the females are going to come back to the river, but sometimes the males, um, they might continue to mate. So um, they don't necessarily fall and die in the river. Some will, but um, certainly you know, most all of the females will as, as they try to, you know, get down to the river to lay their eggs. So mm-hmm. one thing mm-hmm. I I tend to do with my um, spinner patterns that I tie is incorporate an egg pattern um, to, to illustrate that. I don't know if it makes a difference to a fish, but, you know, whatever leg up we, we can have. Um, right. Take, right. right. Well, you know, in, in, I used to want the brown drake hatch i would i would plan my trips around brown drakes to most it was just something about it you know big flies you just think oh it'd be easier to catch big fish lately i have been missing brown drake hatches uh because you probably here's the worst thing that it can ever happen with brown drakes you're on the third night and it's like nothing has happened and you're all excited the air fills up and then the next thing you know there are so many bugs on the water that you can't catch a fish. <laughs> you know, you know I, I think like something the size of a dinner plate has over a dozen flies in it. So not only do they have to hit your plate, they have to hit your fly out of all of those. And it, it, it can be, can be crazy. Uh, what is your favorite? Do you have a favorite hatch that you really want to hit every year? And, and do you like emergences, spinner falls, all of the above? Oh, I, I like all of the above and for different reasons. So um, there's something incredibly exciting about fishing at night. It's really spooky and scary. And you're the, the, all of those feelings, you know, that you hold right here. It's like, I'm terrified, but I'm also super excited. And, um, and then you hear this just enormous feed in front of you. So I have to say, I do really love that. So I, I do love Hex. Hex, Hex sure. are another one that, um, you know, you can spend a lot of time waiting. And of course you have to, there's always the, all the mosquitoes and all of that. Um, but one that, you know, I'd love and, and goes on for quite a while is Isonychia. And you can kind of uh-huh. get your, yeah. your nighttime fix. And then if you have to hike out of someplace at night, um, it's not quite as bad coming out, you know, at 11 p.m. as it is it coming out at 2 a.m. Right. Um, and and they're they're a big bug, and uh, fish really they're they're really starting to look up at big bugs when Isonychia come along, and um, I, I like them a lot. Now I, um, but for daytime fishing, you know, I really love to hunt bugs. I like I like to hunt hatches, so. I, I don't, if you have to, you know, churn water and just fish it because, you know, yeah. it's there. And I, I'd, I'd much rather just walk two miles to find a small pot of feeding fish that are eating emergers. And I love, love, love emergers. And 
Uh I think um, that's where, you know, knowing anything about bugs, um, you can fish something right on the film um, and be very stealthy. And, you know, you, you look to see how the fish is eating. So, you know, it's eating an emerger instead of a spinner. Um, Spinner falls are honestly, I think, you know, the easiest to fish, you know, um, because you can, that fish, it doesn't move an awful lot. It, it's uh-huh. going to be in, going to hang out in the same little lane and just come up, come up. And, and so those are almost the easiest to fish. And, but with the mergers, they're moving around and, and chasing bugs. And um, you pretty much have to keep a really low profile, maybe even be kneeling in a stream. And uh-huh. so I, I love fishing. Um, I love fishing that way. Yeah. There are, you know, I, you know different challenges for each scenario. And, um, but I, I think those are my favorites. The, um, I haven't fished hex hatches a lot. There, there uh, are limit, very limited opportunities in the UP. And so I tend to come down and fish. It's almost more of a social event for me. But the people that have asked me, they, you know, they think I can tell them how to fish for hex. I said, well, the first thing you want to do to practice fishing for hex is go out late at night and, and go to a river or a pond to work anything and then have one of your friends take a big bag of bricks along and while you're standing by the river every once in a while they're going to throw one in the water right next to you and you got to get used to that because otherwise you're going to be too scared while you're out there right <laughs> i remember right. the first time i hex fished that i could not believe it when the first fish rose I, I, it was, I'd never seen anything like that. Oh yeah. It's terrifying. It's <laughs> yeah. just terrifying. And then while you're waiting, you know, when the, you know, a beaver will come along and slap right. the water, that just about, you know, yeah. gives your heart attack. It's just, no, it's great. It's so fun. Are you here a deer? Or, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's all great fun. It and if neat. you're by yourself on top of that, that makes it all that much more. I like to go with somebody, but um, yeah. If there's nobody around, I'm still going to go. And yeah. Um, is it, 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 is it easier to match flies when they're small, when they're medium, when they're big, or do you find a big difference there? Like, are, are, are they less discerning the fish you think for the bigger flies and the pattern doesn't matter as much? Huh. You know, that's a great question. I think a lot of it has to do with um, how fished over the fish are. Um, and is it night? And, you know, what are, are the materials very lifelike, natural, or is there, that's a, that's a hard question. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, you know, when fish, when, when you're imitating some of the smaller hatches, a lot of times it's less the the fly than it is the tippet, I think, in my experience. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, and and whether or not you have a good drift. I think if you put a bug that in a in a fish's lane that's pretty darn close to the natural, um, I think the things that I tend to change up more are are I drop in tippet size. And I check um, my angle and am I, am I getting a good approach in here so that I have a, a better uh, drift so that it's not right. dragging. Yeah. 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 The, 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 uh, I often tell my, my friends that our number one job is to not offend the fish. <laughs> that's it. You know, I mean, that's it. They're, they're, uh, they're probably going to eat a lot of things as long as the, something doesn't offend them about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and uh, the other thing, you know, like, you know, with whatever hatch you think you're fishing, sometimes it's not what they're eating. Right. You know, and and that's when you get humbled. And, and you know, if you're not willing to, I used to go to Joanne Fabrics and get like a little piece of like bridal veil mm-hmm. and you know, kind of hold that in the water to see what was in there. This was before I was really, well, it's like if I've been doing it a long time, let's just say that. And you would 
it's like, oh, look, there's there's a little yellow stonefly in here. Let me let me try that. Wouldn't you think they would eat the brown drake instead? And so yeah. we don't really know why fish are eating what they're eating when they're eating. But if we don't ever try something different, then, you know, we just say, well, that wasn't a good fly. It wasn't a good brown drake. Right, container. right. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, you know, that's those masking hatches are, those are what really humble us. And um, yeah. now they make a really neat little, um, oh, I just blanked on the name of it. It's a little net and it's a little seining net that goes over your net. It just, right, right. You, you Velcro it on to the neck of your um, landing net and then you can stretch it out. It's called a, something saying um anyways it's pretty cool i'll, I'll i could yeah, pull it up sure. anyway yeah it's called hey. a net it's like called a net saying i think yeah yeah and it it's only about this big you know just a little puffy thing and it's basically joanne fabric netting with a little yeah. elastic and it it stretches out and then you can put your net in the water and oh it's called a quick uh, saying that's what it is quick quick saying. yeah that's it okay okay anyway. So you said when when you uh, you started working on the uh, Upper Midwest Hatches book, th there was a book in a motto for the West and one for the East. So mm -hmm. um, how so somebody uh, gets really familiar, they understand the bugs in the in the Midwest. How hard do you find it to adapt to the Western bugs or the Eastern? Eastern bugs. If you if you understand something about the way it works, is it is it make it a lot e easier to adapt? Oh, it does. It certainly yeah. does. So, um, it, if you so Midwestern and Eastern bugs are are quite similar. There's a lot of overlap. We have some things that they do not have, and vice versa. Uh -huh. um, there's a couple things that they have that we do not, but. I think if you know your Midwest or Eastern bugs, you can fish, you know, anywhere. Um, I, mean, I mean, if an Eastern angler came here to Michigan, they'd be able to just learn a couple other things and, and they'd be very comfortable. Going West, um, honestly, the, because we have more habitat here in the Midwest, we have more different uh, insects than they do. They have a lot of... Um, they just don't have as many mayflies as we have. Um, they have probably more stoneflies, but the mm -hmm. but the other cool thing is like if you if you know your Midwest bugs and you go west, it's kind of like uh, the things that they have are just like cousins to what we have, and they all behave similar similarly, and so you know, you, you, you probably even have some flies in your Midwest box that will work there. Well, my here, so, uh, I've never made the jump completely, but I've thought that I could fish a whole season and I would like to do it with, uh, in terms of dry flies with just Robert's yellow drakes in all sizes and Borcher's drakes for dark flies and all, and just try to use those for, if I, if I think it's a light fly. I'm going to use a Robert's if I think it's a dark fly. But uh, in I went to Montana a few years ago. I both the Robert Yellow Drake and the Borchers Drake worked really well mm -hmm. for the cousins, right? And the only yeah. shop uh, Kelly Gallops, he still you know he's got a pattern that that uh, uh, he puts this, his 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 uh, Robert Yellow Drake he he puts the the post backward a little bit. I don't know if you've uh -huh. seen that, but he was the only shop that has Robert Yellow Drakes, and nobody had uh, Borchers. And, you know, they're not fundamentally different than other flies that are either light or dark colored, but I love the Michigan connection to those flies. Yeah. 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 No, that's, that's really neat. I, it's, uh, so, um, there are a lot of blue winged olive, um, patterns that I think, you know, with those two, it would be hard to tie. I guess you could tie a borchers that I don't know how you could tie it that yeah. small, but if you could tie it at a size eighteen, uh huh, you know, um, yeah, I, yeah, but yeah, 
those are those are two great great patterns. Yeah. I try to look at um, you know people will say, well, what what's the best fly to always have in your fly box? And right, it's like right. that's kind of you know yeah. it's it's like you're asking the wrong person that because I'm yeah. I'm gonna have. I'm probably going to have more fly. I probably have too many flies, but I mean, if if you said those two flies that you know, Borchers and uh, Robert Yellow Drake, yeah, and you were having some kind of caddis emergence, then you'd probably be in trouble, right? So right, right. I mean, there there are there there are a lot of good blueprints for for patterns. So Robert Yellow Drake, yeah. that's a good blueprint, and so is a Borchers. Um, um, I've started fishing a lot of clink hammer patterns, oh, you know, those are I, just so awesome. And you can time and all that's a blueprint, right? It's yeah, like, okay, yeah. well, it's tight and this size, this size, this size, this size, change up body color. If, uh, if, if I could have one, one fly, it, it is, it's my modification to an X caddis. I, uh -huh. I, I basically put a shuck on a clink hammer hook. I dubbed a body. I put a peacock curl for the thorax and, and deer hair. I, I'll fish that in mayfly hatches, caddis hatches, because I love that it's in the water. It, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the, and the cool thing is that you figured that out and, um, and, and truly, you know, when a mayfly and caddis are swimming to the surface, you can get away with, it's quick, you know, so fish aren't going to study it for, in, in most cases. I mean, if you're in super technical water, um, which, you know, I, I, th then that all changes, but that's, uh -huh. that's great. That's a, that's an yeah. awesome analogy right there. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, let me shift just a little bit. You, you write about some of the environmental issues in, in, in the book in the, the beginning. And, um, are you noticing, are we noticing things like climate development, water use, uh, changing the hatches in the Midwest? I would say yes. Um, so of course we've had, you know, some really weird winters. Right. Um, we, you know, not having the snowpack, not having that um, water feed into our rivers to, to replenish them through winter and then into spring. I, I've noticed a lot of changes with, with hatches not being as prolific. Um, and then, you know, with just our weird weather, I mean, yeah. you know, with, uh, I've fished with, um, with Johnny Ray on the Manistee and on the upper Manistee and just places where, you know, the, the river level is so darn low that even um, whole banks where hex have always reliably been, wow. the, the bank's gone because the river level is so, so low. So, um you know, those, those hex will have, they have to move. I mean, it, it, they would, the, if the river is coming down slowly, then the hex will move and, and find other suitable habitat. Um, but, you know, who knows if they all make it. So, you know, I feel like some of our hatches have, have changed quite a bit. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, 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 and the, the weird, you know, suddenly super hot when these insects heat is, Insects can survive cold more readily, uh, let's say, it, than than heat. Heat uh -huh. ends up drying insects out, and yeah. um, they're gonna they're gonna be more apt to to die uh, on the wing in in super hot conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, when when uh, uh, conservation organizations get involved in stream improvements, I I always think that the number one goal is to make better habitat for the fish. How important is it to make better habitat for the bugs? And, and, well, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, with the, I, I think about the Asabo River and, you know, uh -huh. it's a multi, multi-use river. Um, of course, it has the famous ca um, canoe race in July. Um, and you've got the, people that are have a more of a canoe mind wanting to pull, for example, wood out of the river just so uh -huh. that they can go flying through there. And all that, all that dead wood in a river provides just an enormous amount of uh, substrate for insects and food. Everything that's in a river and decaying 
you know, something's going to come along and, and eat that. And uh -huh. um, so it's not only food, but it's also, um, you know, a little home, you know, they'll hide in there. And so pulling things out, I, I that's a, that's a bad thing um, is extreme improvements. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example where something was bad, but I think a lot of times, you know, the people that are doing that are, they're doing it for fish, but they're doing it with natural materials, whether they're building uh -huh. bunker structures or whatever, those are all going to have natural materials in there. That'll be good for insects. Um, sometimes I think that, you know, silt is looked at as a bad thing and it can be a bad thing if it, so for example, like in some rivers, you know, where they, I'm, I'm thinking of below a dam, for example. Uh -huh. So you, you've got good gravel and rock and everything. And as they start to take a dam apart, a lot of times mistakes are made and you'll get a huge amount of silt that will wash into a river. And suddenly that's, that's going to be bad because all the, all of the bottom fauna that's relying on the gravel and, you know, feeding on gravel and rock, maybe eating algae and stuff on there. If all of a sudden it's covered in uh, silt, it, that's no good, you know, and, and uh -huh. those insects are going to have to move out of there until the silt can wash away, which can sometimes be a long time. Sure. Probably worse is when sand washes in because sand doesn't really support an awful lot of uh, insects. Uh, uh -huh. If it's a sandy gravelly mixture, that's different. But um, there's there's just not a lot of places to hide in sand or there's not a lot of food on sand for insects yeah. to graze on. So um, those are things to keep in mind. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, you know, if you have a silt bed, certainly um, in a river that's um, not been disturbed, that's good because, you know, that's we know there are insects like hexagenia that live in there and, and that's where they they thrive. So it's kind of, you know, I think when those improvements are made, you have to be mindful of um, what's there, you know, don't, don't take a, don't take a big dead tree out of there just so you can have a better cast. I mean, it's like, you know, what are you going to change here? What insect wise, you know, fish wise, that probably was hiding a number of fish as well. So. Right. Right. What um, we're getting, we're, um, what are you working on now? And do you have any projects? Well, um, I am, I am working. I'm, I'm still, you know, I still write for Michigan trout and I'm writing uh -huh. an article for that now, but, um, this summer I, I want to, uh, start a couple of, uh, rivers up again in my garage. And oh, cool. one thing, what I'm trying to do and this, this is a big undertaking, but I, I've done some work where, you know, I, I'll bring in just one species of mayfly or, um, or caddis and try to videotape, video the insect as it's naturally emerging. Uh -huh. Because that's, and then when you get to show that to people in, you know, um, at a club or, or something yeah. during a talk, and they can actually see in real time how that insect um, is emerging. Yeah. Uh, and then you can you can always look around and just see all the fly tires, and they're like ding 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 ding. <laughs> and about how what materials they can use, and um, but that involves me sitting in front of a tank for yeah. literally, I mean, hours and, I, and and hours and hours and hours and hours. And um, I think that I have to devise a tank that, um, or maybe I have to be somehow camouflaged so that, I mean, the insects obviously are not in a natural setting. So it's probably kind of freaky to hatch out in front of me. And, and I had a sense that, cause you know, I, I'd, I'd be like, all right, I got to take a break and I go in and get a drink and maybe use the bathroom or get a snack. And I uh -huh. come back and they all have emerged. It's like, you really? guys, you, you did that. On <laughs> so I think, um, it, going forward, I'm going to, I'm going to work on, um, trying to build a better 
how to build a better mouse trap, but um, you know, better a better hatching environment so that I can try to get some of that. I've I've yeah. gotten some, but honestly, I I can't even begin to tell you how many hours it took to get you know like one shot. Yeah. But it's very cool. It's really neat. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, I I've kept you for quite a while here. Let me if, if how about if we wrap up? I, I, I ask you just some little silly quick questions. Okay. Um, and I think we hit this one already, but I, I, I'd like to do it again. Anyway, uh, what single fly matches the most hatches? <laughs> um, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to go with a clink hammer. I, I'm going to yeah. go with a clink hammer. Mod- I like your modified uh-huh. X caddis. And I have to say, I never fish an elk here caddis. I only ever fish an X caddis. Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. Just change up the body. Um, I love Dennis Potter's opal elk caddis because opal X caddis, um, that opal in the water just totally reflects beautifully. And Uh um, it it gives a little bit of a glimmer, but not a lot. And um, I have a lot of success with that. So um, always have that. And then any kind of um, cling camera style uh-huh. emerger. I, I'm always going to have, that's not one fly. Sorry, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Can't come up with only one, but those, those blueprints, how's that? Yeah. Yeah. And this is a little personal. I, I, you, uh, by me asking this question, you probably know my answer, but if you could only fish flies that have peacock curl somewhere in them or that don't have peacock curl, which one you're going to go with? Oh, with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's the same kind of thing. It, that is the best material ever, I, I, I yes. in my humble opinion. Yes. Um, one river. one you, uh, you can only fish one river. From now on, what's it going to be? Yes. Uh. <laughs> Sophie's choice. Yeah. <laughs> wow, man. I don't know if I can answer that. That's a good thing that you can't, that, right? Yes. That, that means you have I a love, little... you know, whatever river you're standing in is your uh-huh. favorite river at the time, right? Uh, absolutely. I, I like to approach all rivers, you know, just very methodically because everyone is different and you Uh think it's like you, you prepare and you go and it's like, well, I think these things are going to happen. Do, will they maybe, maybe not. What is it different? Is it, you know, that you never step in the same river twice for uh, just a multitude of, of different reasons. Right. And just because you were there last year at the very same time and, um, you know, you go this time and it's not. And it's like, well, why? Why is that? And yeah. I'm one of those people that it's always why, 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 why? And and that's the fun of fly fishing because it, it's always trying to figure out why. Right, right. So you're traveling uh, north, uh, got a little road trip to get to your favorite river for the day. Um, what, what music are you going to be listening to? <laughs> Well, that depends on if I'm happy or sad. Um, uh, if I'm feeling a little sad, I've got Lucinda Williams on. Uh-huh. If I'm feeling sure. more happy, uh, maybe the Indigo Girls. Oh, okay, great. Um, if it's not music and you want to uh, listen to someone try to make us a little smarter, audio book or a podcast? I love podcasts. Yeah. I yeah. And that, I mean, there's some great podcasts out there. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit of a This American Life junkie, uh-huh. um, a- along with some others. But it's not always fishing. It's oh, It can no. be. Um, uh, oh, you're back. Okay. It, yeah. I, I just, I like a any kind of podcast. It makes your ride go that much faster. It does. It does. Uh, once you're on the river, you got to carry, uh, all your flies around. Uh, do you use a vest, sling pack, backpack, hip pack, or something else? Um, 
So I've been using, I switched over to fish pond fanny pack uh -huh. a long time ago. And I'm, I'm still fishing that kind of, now they're, they're, they're more slingy. Uh, and I had to, I still have that one. It, I don't know how many years old it is, it, but um, I had to get a, a waterproof one. And I still feel like I love that one fish pond, but you know, if you're waiting up over your waist, you know, and everything's wet. Um, so now I've, I've had to upgrade to yep. the waterproof, but they, I love them. And it that's, takes all the pressure off your shoulder. That, that's pretty so. much what I use now. And it's, it, but it's been a quest. Uh, I have been a, a vest away from the vest backpack. I, I went through so many and, and this most recent one that I got, my, my wife says to me, uh, have you finally found a fishing purse that you like? And, uh, <laughs> and I, I have it's to tell hard. her the answer is probably not. I, I, no, I, I, I almost feel like, um, I don't know who's designing them, but yeah. um, they need to have, I don't know. I don't, I could, I could go in there and say, and put them on. It's like, I don't like this because of this. I couldn't you move this here and that there and yeah. um, or put more pockets in them. I hate when you get one and it's just one giant pocket. It's right. like, Right. This doesn't work. No, you know, it's got to have divisions and it's got to have nooks and crannies and um, yeah. yeah. All right. This is the, this question. This is a, a, a personal question. It's going to mean more to people from uh, Michigan, but uh, Gates Lodge, is that a lodge or a motel? <laughs> it's a motel with a wonderful fly shop. And restaurants. <laughs> and, and that, you know, I've, I've been asking people this. It's my wife and I have it's just a little inside story about it. But uh, she conceded that it's a lodge the first night we were there and she ate when we ate in the restaurant. And then she said, okay, it's a lodge. And, and I've asked this to other people and they always say, yeah, what makes it a lodge is that restaurant because it is so good. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Josh, um, Josh uh, Greenberg has done a wonderful job in the changes that he's done um, to that place. And um, it, the restaurant is really, really good now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that place. It, it's, it's just a treasure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, I've kept you quite a while here and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. This was wonderful. I, I, uh, uh, I just had a blast talking with you and, uh, uh, my goal when I listen to podcasts, I want to be smarter when I end than when I began. And you've certainly helped me and I'm sure all of the audience today well, with that. Thank you. thank you very much, Tim. And I've really enjoyed it too. And um, boy, we just anyway. kind of flew along here. We and... did. We did. Now, um, what, what is, what is uh, I will put, we'll put a link somewhere, but uh, your website, if people want to come and learn about uh, all of the work you're doing. So it's easy. It's MidwestHatches.com. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And I, I, I hope the next time we talk, we aren't staring at a screen, but maybe we're standing beside a river. Won't that be nice? That would be wonderful. All right. Let's make it happen. All right. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks, Tim. <laughs>